Welcome to Leaders of the West, a podcast for innovators and change makers. I'm your host, Jesse Jarvis, the founder of Of the West, and I'm sitting down with agriculturalists, entrepreneurs, executives, and everyone in between with the goal of digging into the strategies, mindsets, and lessons that have been crucial to the success of ag and Western. Whether you're carrying on the next generation of your family's operation, starting something from scratch, or determined to climb up the leadership ladder, we're going to inspire you to continue to dream big, growing not just you, but the future of agriculture and Western as a whole. Let's go. Thank you guys for being back for this week's episode. I am really excited to sit down with Caitlin Caney. She is the CEO of Catanio Brothers, a handcrafted snacks company that was founded in 1947 and remains one of the oldest family-owned and operated jerky and sausage factories in America. After graduating from Cal Poly, Caitlin began working for Catanio Brothers, leading their new business expansion. But in 2006, her mom was diagnosed with cancer, and then less than a year later, her dad was suddenly diagnosed with cancer and passed away as well. So Caitlin has had a very interesting journey through the loss of her parents, but has also taken that and has led her where she is today, which I am really excited for you guys to listen to that story and that journey because I know that all of us in our industry go through different hardships and it is really impressive how she has grown through hers as well. And in addition to Catanio Brothers, Caitlin also has two other companies, The Mercantile, a modern mercantile and specialty gift shop that is in downtown San Luis Obispo, and a new venture that she opened up just this year called The Hat Bar by Kate Caney in downtown San Luis Obispo. So with further ado, thank you, Caitlin. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jesse. I appreciate getting to be here. Yeah. So I gave a little bit of background as to who you are, but can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Catanio Brothers, The Mercantile, and The Hat Bar? Sure. So Catania Brothers was, like you had mentioned, was started here in San Luis Obispo in 1947 by two brothers, Bill and Pino Catania. So they actually uh, started their company on the side of working in a meat market in downtown San Luis Obispo and turned, were mixing spices and giving jerky to friends and sausage to friends. And that's really how the business was all began. In the 1970s, they moved over into the meat facility that we're in today here in San Luis Obispo, just right outside of downtown. And my family story coming into the company was that my parents came here to go to Cal Poly in the 70s. And my dad's senior project was a meat business. And that is how after college, he got connected with the Catania brothers and got to know their company. And when the opportunity came available for him to purchase the company in the late 80s, he took it. And so he got out of his food service business and went into, it took over Catania Brothers. And so I have grown up in the company since I was about six years old. After going to Cal Poly here, as you mentioned, I decided to stay in the family business and keep working in it. It's something I always loved being a part of. I wasn't sure it's exactly what I wanted to do, but I did love what we did. And I loved working with my parents. So I had moved to the Valley in 2005 after graduating Cal Poly, did sales for the company there. But in 2006, my mom's cancer had uh, reoccurred in her brain. And so I came back at that point to work alongside my dad in the factory and take care of my mom at the same time. And I, I got to learn quite a bit about the company at that point, helping my dad run more of the daily operations. But then uh, tragically, my father was diagnosed with cancer um, in November of 2007. So it really threw me into the reins of having to take over the company and learn everything because at that point, my mom became president of the company, but she was still fighting her cancer. So while taking care of my dad and trying to get him through his cancer, we had our mom going through it as well, but we also had this you know, family business to take care of as well. So my dad unfortunately passed a couple months after being diagnosed with cancer. And then my mom um, lost her battle with cancer later that year too, as well. And that was um, in 2008, July 2008 specifically. And that is when I took over the reins of the company. And um, since then, I have been navigating the the path of running business operations of manu- uh, meat manufacturing and just taking over the family business and learning and 
And then, so at Catania Brothers, just a little bit about what we do. Um, we've been handcrafting snacks. And for us, it's really about creating a very simple, healthy product to help people live a healthy lifestyle. We really uh, foster relationships with the ranchers to where we source our meat and all of our products. And uh, we also offer uh, European style sausages and gift baskets and a whole line of fruits and nuts and candies as well. So the story about the mercantile is in 2013, the same location, downtown Slow, where my mom once had a gift shop called the Bushel Nepec. When the um, place became available, I decided it would be a really cool opportunity to open a, like a boutique gift shop extension of Kutani Brothers downtown there. So that is when I opened that store and got to kind of infuse more creative gift side to things for all of our Catania products, local gift products, home decor, all sorts of gift items. So I've been doing that since 2013. And then in just this year in April, we opened the hat bar in downtown and it's right next to the mercantile. And that's been a really exciting passion project to just, again, continue to create and bring a little bit of Western flair back into downtown slow, which has been really fun to do. So with the hat bar, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Because obviously the meat side of things and the mercantile side of things, we really, really easy to understand. But you basically go in and custom design hats and have parties for people. I can yeah. tell. <laughs> yeah. I think it kind of all comes from what I learned um, taking over the business and, and the process of you know, taking over it being my parents' company and learning to infuse what I knew to do and what I loved and was passionate about was the show side of things and the event side and um, party planning, bringing people together, connections, all that kind of stuff. And so that's something that we do a lot of at Catania Brothers. And I saw an opportunity with the hat bar to kind of do the same thing where you bring people together. They get to, you know, craft um, and style these, these fun hats. They get to have kind of a little party. We actually in, can offer Catania charcuterie boards and have, you know, make it a fun event for everybody. So it's kind of all connected in its own way, which is really cool. But I think it all comes down to that community and that connection and that getting to know people and just, um, you know, having a good time with people. Well, I love how those businesses are so different, but at the same time, they lend themselves well with one another. Like you just said, you can have people come over for a hat party, but then also provide your products as a snack. Like it all fits really seamless together. Yeah. Yeah. It's been fun how it's all come together and people are excited about it. So that's always really awesome. So as you mentioned, you went through absolute tragedy, losing both of your parents to cancer, not only at a young age in your life, but so close together, which threw you into the CEO role at what would be considered to be a young age. So what did you learn about yourself in that period of time? You know, I think um, being thrown into things and having to immediately manage a staff of 20 plus employees, have to figure out a P&L that I've never had seen before in my life. I think the thing that I realized more than anything in that time, and I didn't realize it right in the thick of it, but as days went on and months went on, I really understood that my parents had really prepared me for that much more than I'd ever had known. And I think that was such a remarkable and comforting feeling to know that because of the wonderful childhood I had grown up around hardworking parents, I grew up in agriculture and just learning how to be a part of family business. I, I all along was prepared for the journey that I was going to have to go through and, you know, just learning that and understanding that and being grateful for that. And um, I think that really helped me get through all the really hard times. It obviously made me learn how strong I really was and where I got that from and really that I believed in myself all along too, right? And I never, quitting wasn't an option. I had to figure it out. You're so right when it comes to quitting is not an option. And oftentimes we we think we're not capable, but what what we can't see about ourselves is hidden hidden within and, and in the right timing, that is when it comes out and we really are, like we were able to show ourselves not just everybody else, you know, what we're really made out of. Exactly. So what is the biggest change that you have seen in yourself since you were first thrown into this role now in your leadership period? What is the biggest change that you've seen? I think um, with growth, the biggest change is just becoming more authentically me, like just really embracing who I am, what I'm passionate about, what we're doing here and understanding for me that it's not at the end of the day, it's not just 
a business to make money and to, you know, to be successful. It's about really the impact that we're making and how are we inspiring others and the next generation and what's, what's the mark that we're going to leave for all those to come. And so I've just learned, you know, through leadership that I, the more confident that I am in myself and the more grace I give myself when there's mistakes or I'm still trying to figure things out is really the change where definitely when I was younger, I was harder on myself. I wasn't always making decisions was quite a bit harder, but now I'm much more secure and really true to who I am and who I was, you know, meant to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. That is such a great answer. So let's go back to the beginning of Catanio Brothers, which began, as you said, in 1947. So much of business has changed since then, but the product and the quality that you guys have maintained since those initial products were released by the Catanio Brothers. So you do a really good job of honoring your business's heritage while also being very future and forward-driven, constantly looking for new, innovative ways and ideas to bring in. How do you balance that act of looking back while also continuing to look forward? Well, I think for us, just staying true to who we are and not following the fads is just something that's always been really important to us. And there was a moment, probably about five years after I'd taken over, where we were doing these events and I was listening to some customers talk about the products. And I, I really realized at that point, like all along, we have been creating this really great product that was made from simple ingredients. It doesn't have all this added stuff into it. It's made an old fashioned way. Like jerky has always been made. And I, I understood at that time, like I always knew it was a great product, but I really understood at that time, like we have something so different, so unique. And so for me, it's always been about honoring that and, and what those, you know, two brothers started with in the beginning and how my parents bought it. And I can even remember my dad when years after buying and probably all the way until he passed away, he never would always say who he was or some people thought he was a Catanio because he just respected their traditions and how they, you know, started the company and how they um, were making the product and crafting it. And I think just from seeing that and growing up around with that, I've always, always honored that and kept it that way while still trying to do our best to um, maintain high quality ingredients and make sure that we're adding any value or anything that we can do to make it better uh, along the way too, without getting caught up in the fads or what, you know, everybody else is doing. So I think that just comes from part of the way I was raised and, and just understanding, you know, what the founders had created and knowing what our customers like. And so just paying attention to all those things, I think helps you really be aware of how special and unique it is and and know that if you veer too far from that, then you're going to take away the uniqueness of it. Well, and you guys do have a very unique product, which on the jerky side of things, you guys recently partnered with who I would consider to be the voice of rodeo, Bob Tallman, and his beef jerky brand. So can you tell us how that partnership came about? Is that something that you approached him about or did he approach you? And in a deal like that or a, a partnership, what do you consider before you decide, is this a good collaboration for our brand or is it something that maybe wouldn't be a great fit? Sure. Sure. So we have uh, participated in the Elks Rodeo. We have had a booth there and been a sponsor of it for many years. And the CEO of Elks Rodeo had texted me and she said, I have someone that wants to meet you. And I was like, who wants to meet me? So I went back behind and she introduced me to Bob. And I was like, wow, this is so rad. But like, why am I getting to meet Bob? This is so cool. I didn't know he had a jerky company. I just, like you said, I knew him as the voice of Rodeo. And so we started talking beef and me and talk, he was talking to me about his cattle, you know, business back in Texas. And then next thing I knew, I learned that he had a jerky company and that was in September, I believe 2021, I think it was, it was kind of that coming out of COVID. So the rodeo was an off year. And so it took us about a year of talking and kind of like, you know, trying to figure out if it'd be a right fit, learning more about Bob and what he did and what he wanted with his jerky company. And it kind of evolved from being uh, that we were just going to make it because he had a, you know, somebody making it for him in Texas. And it, and he, he really, he, he went to Cal Poly, he knew about our brand, he loved everything we were doing. 
So it seemed like a perfect fit for him. And the more I got to know Bob and everything that he has done, specifically, I think like you'd said, like, how do you, how do you determine if these partnerships are a fit? And for me, we look at our, our core values or, or why we do the things we do. That's what we are always looking at, you know, and Bob is very devoted to 4-H and FFA. And he's also very devoted, has uh, ties in with cancer research and giving back to that. And those are two things that like really are very, very important to me and a big part of my life. And then just getting to know him and all the things that he's doing for, you know, the Western industry and his growing, his background of growing up. I just knew in my heart that this was going to be a really cool opportunity. And, you know, he wanted someone that could take it and keep his legacy, of his jerky business going. And I knew that I could do that. And for me, I also wanted to make it a better product for him. And I knew that we could add that, you know, value to his line already. And so in, it would have been about September of 2022. That's when things really started work, you know, talking, trying to figure out all the stuff of what's happening. And then in uh, January of this year is when we actually acquired the whole thing. So we are in charge of the crafting of it, all the, we, you know, we source everything for it. And when, then we also do all the marketing and selling for it as well. So it's been really exciting. We have been trying to, you know, improve upon the recipes, but stay true to what his style is and what his customers like. But it's been really fun to work with Bob and get to know more about him and his passions and his goals. And I think that's the other thing too. We just in meeting Bob, he was so, he's so passionate. And I feel the same way about what we do and just life in general. And we really connected on that level. So. I want to highlight something that you said about when you and Bob first started talking, and that was September of 2021 or around in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from that time, it took a year and a half, almost two years to make that collaboration happen. And I think that that is one thing that I, as an entrepreneur, foolishly thought that partnerships happen in a very short amount of time. And I can tell you from my experience with Of the West and on personal things, that is not the case at all when it comes to business partnerships slow and steady wins the race. You have to really do a lot of your due diligence. They take time. They take a lot of nurturing. Like it is a true relationship. Just like if it, if you're a spouse, right? I mean, there are people who meet their, their husband or their wife and, you know, they get engaged in a week, but typically, right? You like you date one another for about a year. I think the same happens in business relationships. And I wish that that's actually something that more people talked about because right. I think that when from the outside looking in, we think, oh man, these things happen in the blink of an eye. And that is not the case behind the scenes. Yeah. No, I, I agree 100%. And I think, I think in my journey of taking over the business and, and, you know, one of the things I look back on is I, I've been very conservative about what I do or how long it's taken to do things and probably have missed quite a few of opportunities or, you know, we're not as big as where we could be, but like you said, like it's very important to take the time and to do the things right. And that's how I believe I want to make sure I understand it. We're going to nail it. We're going to do it right. And what's meant for you isn't going to go away. And that's just the way I see it. Like if it's meant to be right and part of your journey and your story, then it's not going to go. And, you know, I, I think that if you take the time to do it right and figure it out, it sometimes can make the story even more special. So. You are so spot on. And I think too, a lot of times we think that it's going to be a missed opportunity, but sometimes it's not a right then, but that doesn't mean it's not a right fit down the road. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So off of the topic of jerky, and now let's go back into leadership. You have a variety of different businesses. Obviously, we have the jerky side of things, then you have the mercantile, and now the hat bar. As a leader, do you ever notice that your leadership needs between those businesses change or can your leadership style stay the same across all brands? I That's such a great question, especially since things are so different, right? And, you know, got a factory where we're smocked up, we're USD inspected every day to girls that are down at a gift shop doing retail. But I don't think that my leadership style changes. I think that it grows over time learning more about people, business, and myself. But I have found that I really have always ran it the same way and not just because I'm so passionate about it. And I I get in there. It's a very hands-on approach. We figure it out together. I want to be there. I want to do it. I want to be a part of it. I'm going to trust you 
too, to figure it out and do it, keep going on your own too. But I think just, I've always been right in there with my staff to figure things out, to learn, to train, to get systems in place. And, you know, oftentimes I have to jump into situations right there with my boys and, and that I have and figure it out. And I think that that's just kind of been always been the way that we do it. And my staff knows that about me. And I think over time I've learned to maybe, um, delegate better and, um, trust more, but I've always still wanted to be a part of the process because I truly care about it and our brand and what we're doing. And, and I want my staff to feel that and get that same energy and feel and, you know, have that same passion as well. Well, and your staff probably appreciates that you are somebody who is quote unquote in the trenches with them often doing the thing. It's not, you know, you're not leading from the top, you're leading from within. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about how you navigate life as an entrepreneur. You are somebody with multiple irons in the fire. And I don't know that we've mentioned this, but you have two (laughs) twin boys. They're eight. Is that right? I do. Yep. Eight years old, almost nine. They are at busy ages. So (laughs) you have two boys, three businesses. Do you have any strategies or boundaries or mom hacks that you live by? How do you do this? I mean, it's such a hard thing to navigate and everybody's going to do it different for what works for them. And I, I think for me, I mean, my staff, like saying how I'm a very hands-on person, my staff also knows that my family and my boys are my number one priority and they're always going to be, you know, work's going to always be there. And one of the things I learned from my parents is that they worked so, so hard to provide us with such a, you know, great, very normal life, but they lost sight of taking care of themselves. And if I don't walk away from what I experienced with my parents and seeing that, then I'm not learning and being a better mom and better person. And so, you know, I I don't know that there's such thing as balance always. It's going to be different for everybody. I think it's a, a lot about giving yourself grace and patience where you can. But I just think like being a family business and understanding and working you know, with a compassionate understanding of like, I care about their families, I care about their health and well being, and my staff cares about the same. It allows me to come and go as I need so that I can put my kids first and really, truly also find time to take care of myself because I truly believe that saying in the oxygen mask if you do not take care of yourself, you cannot take care of anybody else. Like at some point, it's going to blow up on you. It really is. And so you have to do that. And it's not selfish to do that. And what that might be for you is different from anybody else. So I think not comparing in your journey of business and being a mom or whatever your roles are, I think that's a very important part too. And then again, just kind of, it comes down to those core values, just like with business, like in your life and, and what's, what's important to you. And for me, it's, if I'm creating, you know, healthy meals for my kids and giving them a healthy lifestyle and lots of love and attention and also showing them what hard work is and what a family business is. Then at the end of the day, I know that, you know, the juggle is worth it and that we're doing okay. So you talked about something that is really important and that is taking time for yourself. I think that, you know, we have a a wide variety of listeners But I think that two specific areas, we have a lot of female listeners. So a lot of them are moms. They understand that side of things. And then we also obviously have a lot of people from ag and Western industries, whether that's farming operations, ranching operations. And I think that traditionally those two groups, farmers, ranchers, moms, probably take the worst care of themselves because they give it to everybody else first. So do you have any specific things like how do you dedicate and devote time to yourself? I think you have to be realistic about your time. So one thing I've found is that you're just not going to have a lot of time as a mom and a business person, right? But even just carving away a little bit of time to do that one thing that makes you feel better or, you know, gives you a break from the chaos of things is important to do. And I, you just have to, I think you have to really also just like learn to not care what people think and what what's going to come of it or what people are going to do or whatever. Like you have to find time to take care of yourself and it doesn't need to be a lot. It doesn't have to be this glorious spa day, you know, but it could just be having a cup of coffee in silence, whatever it is, you have to make time for it and we have to take care of ourselves. And I think that's something that I wish people really honestly paid more attention to because you're not going to be here for the long run if you don't. So. 
No, and I love what what you say there too about you know there's not a lot of time for it. So making it easy. I will say, and I've I've said this before, but mine is in the evenings after dinner. If I have laundry to fold, I will pour myself a glass of wine. I will come in. Justin will take care of the kids, obviously. They'll go outside. Maybe they'll ride their horses. And I'll turn on a trashy TV show and I'll fold laundry and I'll drink my wine because I get my silence. I feel like I'm being productive because I'm somebody who can't necessarily sit still. Mm -hmm. So the laundry, it always (laughs) needs done. There's never a shortage of laundry. So I'm at least being productive. I get to enjoy my TV show. I have my glass of wine and that is my, like my me time. But I've had to carve that out because we live, you know, 60 miles from a Target. So it's not like I can easily take myself shopping and wander down the aisles of Target aimlessly. So I think that being really intentional about what is easy for me to do, what's something that's consistent, how is my spouse or my partner going to be able to help me in that, just making it really easy to do. And then that way you can maintain that long term. Yeah. I think you touched on another really big thing too. And you said asking your spouse to help. Like we, we have to ask for help and that took me a long time to do. And I understood that was part of the grieving process for me is I didn't want to ask for help because it's kind of angry about things and sad and all those feelings. And it took me a long time to feel like I could ask for help and not feel like I owed somebody something back or that I was going to be a burden to them. You know, I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. All these feelings when really it doesn't matter. People want to help and you've, you've got to be able to to ask for that help and it will make things a lot easier. You are so spot on. Asking for help is the absolute hardest thing to do. And on the flip side of that, when somebody asks us for help, we'll drop whatever it is that we're doing more often than not to help them. Like we love when people ask us for help. So the reverse psychology of that is people want to help us. We shouldn't be so worried to ask for it. Yes. Yep. Yes, exactly. Okay, well, let's get to what we call the rapid fire round. So these are the same questions that we ask all of our guests. They don't necessarily have to be like your traditional quick rapid fire answers because some of these are longer. But the first one is, what's the best piece of business or personal advice that you've ever been given? Okay, so I have two pieces of advice and one's from my dad and one's from my mom and I hold them near and dear to me. So one piece of advice from my dad that he gave me in business was to always keep your head down and keep moving forward and to not pay attention to what the competition is doing or what people are saying. And that is something that has stuck with me through all of the the changes of, of time with business or challenges that we have been faced. And I think it's also another been a big part of helping me stay true to who we are and what we're doing is not getting caught up in what people are saying what I should be doing and uh, what the competition is doing. Um, just staying focused on what I know to do, what we have been doing. You know, you can't completely block out competition because you want to know what's happening in the industry and stuff, but not being worried about it and not questioning your own self by, by paying attention to it. So that has been something that my, has stuck with me forever. And then my mom's advice was something that I remember since I was little. I was, I was probably more like in middle school and she said this and I'll, I'll never forget. I was right. We were right in her kitchen and I'm, I was having a hard time with something. And she said, and I was, I was going, I, was, I remember crying <laughs> like life isn't fair and it's just not fair and all the, it's not fair. And I can remember her just stopping and saying, Caitlin, life is not fair and it's never going to be fair. And that is something that has so deeply stuck with me forever through all the things that I've had to go through and face. And, you know, my mom was, was a very optimistic person. So she didn't say it with, mean it with any negativity, but I think she just, from all her hardships she had been through, she was very honest and real about it. And, and so even in that moment when I was younger and I didn't want to hear that, it's really carried me through life. And I now as a, as a mom, and, you know, when I hear those statements coming from my boys, I have added a little extra piece to it because I'll hear that it's not fair. And I'm like, life is not fair and it will never be fair, but it is beautiful. And so that is just a a really strong piece of advice that I've carried with me forever. Oh, I really relate to that last one because our son, he's five. And so he's (laughs) in that it's not fair. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately because obviously this it's, you know, kind of towards the end of summer and he's been home quite a while. And I keep thinking to myself, I think when did we ever teach people that life is 
fair. Like even at five, he he thinks life should be fair. <laughs> I feel like that is the biggest injustice that we have ever done in society. At some point, people have thought yeah. that it's going to be fair and it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get it. It's a natural thing for this that it is said or thought, but how, like, how how do we come up with that? But I think the sooner that we're real and honest about that and understand that it can be unfair, but it can still be very beautiful, that you are focusing on trying to find the good and all the bad. So, well, on the topic of finding the good, if you could give people any words of wisdom and you knew that they would take them to heart, what would they be? I think the one single most thing for me would be to not wait to do it now to there's not going to ever be the perfect time to do what you may need to do. And, you know, I think when I say that, I mean it more for like the things that nag you that you want to do, whether it's open a business, get healthier, start working out, spend time with a friend, take a trip, all those things that, you know, are constantly on our mind and we should do it, but I'll do it later or I'll do it next year. The reality is, is that tomorrow is not guaranteed and, um, you know, time flees and we always think we have more time. And I think that's one of the problems we get ourselves into often. And I, I've definitely been through that so many times and really had to sit in that grieving of understanding that of losing family members and not saying what I wanted to say or being in denial. And it's really made me just have such a different view on life and when I talk to friends or whatever, just do it, find a way, you know, you're not going to regret it. I mean, obviously there's some things you just can't, but you can find a way if you really want to. Okay. Well, I will say the next question. I almost hate to ask this one because <laughs> I feel like with all of the tragedy that you've gone through in life, it's almost a little bit insensitive, but at the same time, I am very, very excited to hear your answer because I know the sentiment that's likely going to be behind it. So if you could go to dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would you pick? I had to really think about this one. I'll let you pick just, two. Yeah, no, it's okay. I mean, I actually, I love being asked these questions sometimes after being so in work mode and all these things, you know, but really, it, and I feel like sometimes I feel bad for saying this because I love my mom and dad equally. And I was super close to my mom, but really I, I would love to sit down with my dad. You know, he was taken from us so fast, um, such a short period of time. He was in Stanford for a month during Christmas, our busiest season. And, you know, he was the first, you know, with our mom, she was beating it. She was fighting cancer. She was a fighter. And my dad was too, but we just, it just happened so fast. And we were in denial of what was happening in survival mode. And so, I mean, within two months he was gone and I didn't get to ask anything, nothing, nothing at all. And there's so much I'd love to know about my dad. He grew up 4-H, FFA family of eight. She's a hard worker. He met my mom in high school, high school sweethearts. He was a storyteller. He was known to be a storyteller and people loved hearing his stories. And I just would love to sit and just listen to the stories because, you know, when you're younger, you don't, you don't appreciate those things, but when they're gone and you're older and especially as parents, you're, you realize how special, you know, those stories and understanding their child and all that is. So that would definitely be who I'd like to have dinner with. Well, and there's never a wrong answer, but holy cow, you you <laughs> gave the, I knew that was the kind of answer that you would give. <laughs> what is one quote that you lead your life by? So I, <laughs> I'm a quotes girl. I love quotes. I think that's been one thing that has truly helped me through life, all different stages and seasons is quotes. But I might say her name wrong, but Brené Brown is definitely someone that I've always loved her quotes. I feel like she's very real and inspiring. And I actually had to write it down because I don't have it fully memorized because it's a longer one. But my favorite quote of hers is it goes that I now see how owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we'll ever do. And I think there's several reasons why that quote means so much to me. And I, I think, you know, the first part about owning our story. I think that if everybody was to do that and we shared our story, how powerful would that be if we weren't afraid of what happened and what we went through or what others would think about us, like how, how that would impact our world and what we're doing. And then loving ourselves to the process because that's part of grieving and going through things. And um, I think that's something too, that's very hard for people to do. And it's been something I've had to learn and understand 
through all the things. And I feel like those two things, when you do that, it just, again, leads you back to that authentic place in life where you really are who you're supposed to be and doing what you're supposed to be doing and, you know, leaving a greater impact on what we're doing here in the world. Ooh, that I've never heard that quote before. And that is, if for those of you who are listening, don't worry of the West, we, I will make (laughs) sure that we type that up. We'll share it in our stories. That is one that we all need to see, hear, read. It needs to be like on your, what is that? The, like the background of your phone. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about your favorite things. Do you have a favorite, a product or a service or a book podcast? What if, what do you want to share with people? You know, I, I, I have not ever dove into specific things like that and like had something that I truly love, which I don't, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I'm trying harder to get into more podcasts now, especially being on the road more. So that's been something that I've been dabbling in, which has been fun. But as far as books, I've read so many books and they all touch me in different ways. And then, uh, I, I, I think in some ways I've just very simple that it's just the little things in life, like having coffee, like those routines, right? Having a good coffee, getting to work out. It's very important to me um, to have that time and to know that I'm taking care of myself. And then, you know, spending time with my friends and having those outlets are, are really important to me. So I've never really gotten into like any set thing to like help me through things. It's been a lot of pieces that have contributed to helping me through everything that I've, you know, gone through in my, in my story. So. Well, I will say that really was the best answer though, because now <laughs> I encourage every single listener to do something, one thing for yourself this week, and then share with us, tag Caitlin and tag of the West or tag me and tell us what it was. What was the one thing that you took time to do for yourself? Maybe you bought yourself coffee or you went to the gym or you, you know, whatever it is, do something for yourself. Because I think that that has been a continuing theme throughout this entire episode that is so important that none of us take enough time for. Yes. Perfect. Kate, well, where can, actually, before I ask where people can follow you, can we talk about the product and where people can go try your jerky and buy your jerky from? Yes. So we manufacture, produce everything here in San Luis Obispo in our factory. Um, so you can actually come here and see it and smell it and hear it all be made. But for anybody outside of our, you know, about our 90 mile radius north and south, which we're in every store, gas station, grocery store, breweries, wineries, you can find us there. But outside of that, you really got to go online to our website to www.catanigobros.com and all of our products are online. Um, we ship daily. You can actually still call us and our staff picks up the phone. We'll take your order. Love to talk to you. We love talking to people and hearing um, who's calling in. You can email us. And then um, we are working on more nationwide growth. That is our big push right now of getting out. And then Bob's Jerky too, you can get on our website. And then he's in all the boot barns. Not all the boot barns, but a lot of boot barns out throughout the United States and then central markets in Texas as well. Well, I will say prior to this episode ever being recorded, because this is the first time that Caitlin and I have ever met, but I have had the product maybe about a year ago, and it is so good. You guys, I am a jerky lover. I eat jerky every day, numerous times a day, and this stuff is at the top of my list. So I can attest to the quality of the product. I understand why it has been around since 1947. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Okay. Well, now where can people who want to follow you, learn more about you, hang out with you, see those handsome young men of yours, where can they find you online? Yeah. I mean, we, our website has a lot of stuff, but you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook. We try to share as much as we can on there about our story and what we're doing. I like, like I said, we love the connections. We love getting to know people. We hit the road a lot. So if you can kind of keep track on Instagram or Facebook where we're going to next, we'll be at the NFR in Vegas. So if you are all there, you can come by our booth there and try the jerky and meet us too as well. So getting to meet people on the road is a fun way to to find us too. Okay. Well, you guys will know where I will be come December <laughs> at the NFR. I will be at the Catano Brothers booth. And with that... This episode is over, but make sure you guys go tag us in the one thing that you are doing for yourselves this week. We want to see it. We want to hear about it. And we want to encourage you to take that time for yourself. It is so very important. 
Thank you, Caitlin, so much for sitting down with us today. I know you have inspired so many people with your story, and I am excited to meet you in person now in December. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate it. We'll see you guys back here next week. If you loved this episode, do us a favor and share it with someone else who might find just as much value in it as you did. We're on a mission to continue to grow and strengthen the future of agriculture and Western industries, and you spreading the word helps us make more of a positive impact. It also makes a big difference when you take a minute to go rate and review the show. We can't thank you enough for listening, for sharing, and for loving Ag and Western as much as we do. We'll see you back here for our next episode.